Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kathy, and I'm a data scientist at GitHub. And this session is dedicated to a review of this year's Octoverse report. We publish Octoverse report every year to share data around all the amazing work you have done and the community you continue to build. And this year, I'm so excited to have two wonderful guests joining me on stage, Rachel and Stephen. Rachel recently joined GitHub as the VP of engineering, and she runs the data org here. She has dedicated much of her career to developer-focused system, and she's very passionate about helping developers to learn and helping making technologies easier, safer, more fun, and more accessible to everyone. Stephen is a co-founder of Redmonk, a company that is focused on software practitioner and the developer research. He has spent over a decade trying to help developers to understand the broader trend in the industry by analyzing who's using what and why. Welcome, Rachel and Stephen. So great to be here, Kathy. Glad to have you. Thank you, Kathy. Should we get started? Yeah. At GitHub, our mission is to be the global platform for developer collaboration. And today, we're home to over 40 million developers. From open source project maintainers to contributors to researchers and scientists. From enterprise users to students and teachers. This vibrant, growing community in the last year alone has created over 44 million new repositories. 87 million pull requests, and closed over 20 million issues. Today, GitHub is also home to over 1.7 million students and 31,000 teachers. They use the platform to help learn software development and the developer collaboration and also best practices. And these are real-world use cases where college and universities help to embolden the community of our future developer. Rachel. From your perspective, how do you think this trend of helping, uh, how do you think of the trend to using our platform for learning, and how do you think this will impact our future generation of developers? Well, uh, first of all, Kathy, I want to give a huge call out to you and a thank you to you for all the great work you did in helping uh, pull the data for this year's Octoverse report. You know, I've only been at GitHub for just over a month, um, but I had so much fun working on this report with you and the fantastic team behind it. And it was just really inspiring to me to see all the great work being done uh, in communities around the world. So that was really exciting. But I must say, I feel particularly enthusiastic and inspired by these um, education numbers, which are really special because, uh, as you noted in the intro, I feel really passionate about um, the idea of making careers in technology more accessible to more people. And the work being done uh, by our education teams to help grow this com these communities is really, really phenomenal. So, you know, I think back to when I was a new software developer and the first job I had in industry, and it was super overwhelming and super intimidating because not only was I one of the only women in the room, but I was also in exposed to entirely new um, software development stack, uh, new developer tools, new workflows, new processes that I had just never seen before in an environment where I was actually pretty uncomfortable asking questions. So I look at these numbers and I think, wow, I I'm really hopeful that this is a, a big group of students who are able to ask questions of one another, who are learning together with the real world tools that they're going to use to be successful in industry. Right. And um, you know, as doing some research for the Octoverse report, I spent some time talking to the education team. I'd really like to give a shout out to them. They're an awesome team doing really great work. And um, so not only are they doing work to grow these communities of students, they're also doing work to support teachers. You know, we understand that teaching is an incredibly difficult job. So if we can provide industry standard tools to teachers for free and help them sort of make their lives a bit easier and help help improve their teaching outcomes, that's something that's really great too. So as you can tell, I care a lot about this topic. I could probably <laughs> use a whole session talking about it. I'll just mention one last thing uh, that the, Vanessa, the lead of the education team, told me, which was um, she was explaining to me how the Campus Experts program works. And this is a program where um, you know, we're really empowering 
experts around the world on campuses to build inclusive uh, communities of developers for learning. And you know, the thing I really like about this, this program is that we really recognize that um, it's the people on the ground who know best what their communities need. And so uh, Vanessa was telling me about, you know, in some cases, um, spending funds on a pizza party might be the best way to grow an inclusive community. Right. But in other places, um, there's examples of people using uh, GitHub's funding to pay for generator hours. And so, um, you know, I think it's really inspiring to think of the creativity of these campus experts who are really helping grow the next generation of software developers and helping them do their best work. Definitely. As a former data science student myself, I want to give a shout out to the Berkeley Data Science Program. Uh, we use the GitHub extensively through our master program, and we benefit from that tremendously. Awesome. Stephen, we would want to hear your thoughts on this as well. Sure. So, you know, for, for anyone in the audience who knows Redmuck, and more particularly for those that don't, um, you know, Redmuck has argued for a long time that developers are empowered in ways they have never been before. Uh, you know, and they, they manifest this sort of uh, this, this power that they've accumulated in many ways throughout their individual careers and their enterprise. Uh, one of the reasons for this, of course, is uh, the difference in education. So Rachel talked about, you know, when you know, she was getting into the business as a, um, you know, cutting her teeth as a developer. You know, I had that same experience, you know, when I got started <laughs> much longer ago than I would care to admit at this point. Uh, and, you know, I didn't have the resources that are available to developers today, right? There wasn't this wealth of uh, open source software available that I could go and pick up and learn from. Um, you know, the tools you know, to allow that kind of collaboration weren't there. Right. Um, online courseware, you know, was not a thing. So, you know, it was much more difficult, um, you know, back in my day, you know, <laughs> um, you know to, to learn, you know, certainly it is today. The institutions themselves have also evolved, right? right. You know, they, many of you uh, in the room who, you know, have graduated from, from computer science programs, you know, sort of over the last decade had a very different experience, you know, perhaps, you know, than... Uh, those of us who took computer science, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, the institutions have evolved, right? right? The institutions, the curricula uh, associated with them are night and day different in terms of the way that they, they teach uh, computer science today. And, you know, sort of, you know, perhaps lastly, and maybe most importantly, uh, we have seen this new class of educational institution emerge in these, these boot camps, right? And this is near and dear to my heart because, you, know, uh, you know, when I graduated from college, and I started with a systems integration firm, you know, I effectively went through a, you know, the equivalent of a boot camp. You know, it was an eight-week residential program. Uh, and so it's great to see you know, so many of these educational opportunities which can take you know, so many more people and get them into the industry, get them familiar with uh, you know, computer science and get them contributing uh, to software around the world. Very interesting, thank you for sharing. Now I wanna switch gears to working professionals. Our data indicate an increasingly interconnected community and that, of course, including our developers at work. In fact, both the diversity and engagement metrics around our, among our enterprise users are trending up. In the last year alone, 70% of the global Fortune 50 companies have made contribution towards open source projects on GitHub. So Rachel and Steven, I'd love for you guys to walk us through this trend of open source at work. How do you expect that to grow? Yeah, so I mean, this trend is growing and, you know, there's no signs of it slowing down. And I think, you know, companies big and small around the world recognize the value that's out there in the open source right. community. There's just millions of people um, working and some of the brightest minds in the world. And, you know, when you just have that many people, you know, I firmly believe that more eyes on code and more heads thinking about a problem leads to more robust and sort of uh, more creative solutions. So for sure, um, you know, this is something that enterprises are getting on board with. I actually live this firsthand because, um, you know, I spent over the past decade of my life at Google where we really moved from sort of a more walled garden software development approach to really recognizing the value of open source. But, um, you know, I really like to think about human beings. So, so one, one thing I would attribute to this trend as well is also the motivation of individuals. So, you know, I remember many, many years ago as a software developer manager, uh, the first time I had someone on my team uh, contribute to open source, and so it was long before GitHub existed, but this is a person on my team who wrote one line of code and submitted a patch to the Linux kernel. And the amount of pride and excitement that that individual got from doing that, this is a person who was writing thousands of lines of code inside our company, 
But like right. that one line of code meant so much to this person. And you know, it's part of being bigger, you know, part of something that's bigger than, than, than you, being part of you know, a movement that's changing the world, affecting people all around the world. So I think there's some real human motivation to getting involved in, in open right. source. Uh, we understand now, too, that um, you know, a lot of times technology decisions in companies are being made at the grassroots level. So you know, no longer is it really the CEO or CTO who's making the call on what technology to use, but it's really the developers and development teams who you know, see the value in open source, see what's out there, and right. then also, I believe, have this you know, human motivation to engage in this global community. Nat, uh, this morning in his keynote, called um, open source uh, the biggest team sport in the world, and I think it's really fun to be you know, a part of that world. Yeah, it's a great sport. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, what about you? So, yeah, so I, I think the human motivation angle, uh, I think, is, is exactly correct. And I think that can also work in, in sort of the opposite direction, if you will. So we tend to think of companies in many cases as these sort of anom anonymous, like faceless, you know, sort of entities that are sort of divorced from, from human emotion. And the fact they, they sort of exhibit, you know, very human traits in, in many cases. So, you know, when we talked, uh, you know, we, we still use this today, but, you know, certainly, uh, you know, as companies started to sort of approach open source, one of the things we talked to them about was the pattern that we have seen play out, you know, sort of in the past, right? So if you go back to, say, circa 2000, right, what we all now take for granted in software as a service was introduced as this idea, and companies looked at this and said, absolutely not. I mean, this is insane. You know, they had up to that point, been accustomed to buying their software, owning their software sort of in perpetuity. And you know, sort of this new model coming in and saying, well, you're going to rent it and so on, it was just it was too much. Uh, over time, of course, as any you know, sort of user of github.com you know, knows uh, right now, software as a service has become mainstream. Right? It's regular. Everyone does it. Everyone uses it. And we see sort of much the same trend at work with open source in the sense that in the early days when companies looked at this, they said, no, no, I can't do it because I don't want to fund my competitors. I think this is some you know, sort of proprietary advantage. You know, they focused on all these sort of perceived risks and downsides you know, in a very, again, human fashion. When you know what we've seen, sort of, and it, it's a gradual process. It's not a, you know, there's no, unfortunately, sort of, you know, overnight epiphany that companies tend to come to. But when they look at this sort of over time, what they find out in most cases is that uh, there are many, many more benefits that outweigh easily the sort of perceived risks and downsides. So what we end up seeing today is, is that you know, from a trajectory standpoint, you know, it's just, you know, we see more and more contributions coming from, you know, these sort of Fortune 500, Fortune 100 organizations. Simply because it makes business sense, right? right? You know, the upside is again just much greater than the downside. It's just you have to, you have to be patient as they get through that process. Yeah, definitely. When it comes to software development, many of our users wear more than one hat. At GitHub, our mission is to be the home for all developers. So that's why when we segment our data geographically, we see millions of our users are creating repositories, commenting on issues, making pull requests, and making contributions from just about anywhere. In fact, as we noted today, nearly 80% of our contributors come from outside of the United States. Rachel, I'm curious to see your thoughts on this contribution diversity that is happening on GitHub. Can you share something? Yeah, well, first of all, I love it. I mean, uh, GitHub is the home for all developers, and that's not constrained by geographical boundaries. So I think this is really excellent. And you know, if you, if you dig in uh, to the Octaverse report, uh, you'll see we have some statistics around uh, contributors by continent. Right. And at this point, uh, North America is actually third after Asia and Europe, which is you know, really what you would expect from a population um, perspective. So I think it's really nice to see that increased uh, global representation and a, a very positive thing. Um, this, here we're talking about not just open source contributions, but we're talking about contributions um, to both public and private repos. And so I think there is one factor uh, that made a bit of a difference here over the last year, which is um, earlier this year, GitHub released the f free private repos, That's right. allowing developers to host uh, private repos for free, as the name implies. Um, and uh, so I think you know, that's a really interesting trend, because we've seen adoption and engagement with that uh, feature 
all around the world, I think um, you know, we shouldn't uh, underestimate the difference that in some places around the world, a few dollars can make towards actually being able to start a business right. or not, right? Mm -hmm. So this is really removing a barrier to entry for some people uh, where you know, they want to start a business, they want to maybe keep some IP private, or they're not yet ready to share what they're working on with the world. Um, so this is really an enabler to, I think, global diversity, which um, you know, I really like a lot. Another, another point I'll make is a trend that I'll want to keep an eye on for the next year or so. In, uh, in today's keynote, Nat mentioned uh, and went over the uh, mobile uh, developer experience, right. which is something I'm really excited about. Because we know that at certain places in the world, mobile phones are critical for access to technology. And so, you know, in some developing countries, you wouldn't expect people to have laptops or desktops everywhere. And, you know, a phone is just a really great enabler. So I'll be really curious to see how this trend evolves. And I hope that we'll see even more representation from uh, developing nations in these stats. Um, one fun point I will point out from the numbers is Free private repos was literally in every continent. Right. And we even saw uh, some free private repo usage in Antarctica. Yeah. Which is fascinating. Those penguins. <laughs> I'd love to know what they're doing down there, but yeah, <laughs> it's really great. cool. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, um, speaking of growth in Asia, I want to focus on China and India for a moment. We have seen users from these two countries grow significantly in the past few years. We're so happy to see them leveraging our open source community and making contributions at the same time. So Stephen, from your research and experience, is that something you've seen elsewhere? Yeah, so you know, really what, what we see are, you know, to Rachel's point, I mean, the, the numbers that we're beginning to see look more like what you would expect based on population, right? right. Uh, they have been artificially constrained in many cases you know, due to uh, you know, sort of a variety of barriers. They can be language, it can be procedural, um, it can be you know, essentially uh, attitudes or philosophy towards open source. There's a lot of different sort of you know, potential impediments. What we've seen certainly in recent years is you know, sort of the, the uh, active elimination of these in some cases. The, um, some of them have just subsided sort of more, more naturally, more gradually. But, you know, basically for, you know, both the, the sort of um, the, the projects themselves are better positioned today. Uh, they are designed in many cases to be more accessible to global audiences. Uh, you know, in both directions, right? So in other words, you have projects that start in you know, sort of a broad, uh, I'm thinking things like TIDB, that position themselves, you know, sort of expressly with uh, an attitude to try to bring in contributors from North America um, and vice versa. But then, you know, sort of just as importantly, you see outreach from individual communities. So in other words, you see many, many more foundations participating in um, and organizing and putting on, in, in fact, um, events, you know, in China, in India, in right. different locations to try to make sure that the expectation isn't always, well, yeah, if you want to participate, you have to come to us, mm -hmm. right? Instead, we will come to you and we will bring these projects and our expertise and our people um, abroad. So, you know, really what we end up seeing is, is that um, the demand for development talent is such that, you know, people will go literally all over the world to get it. Um, and part of that, um, you know, part of that process and part of that, uh, you know, sort of bringing them on board is, again, trying to ease some of those restrictions, trying to ease some of those, um, those factors that would otherwise you know, sort of uh, uh, limit you know, the participation in open source communities. So we expect it to continue. Yeah, absolutely. We see users from those two countries are catching up very fast. Yeah. Our community at GitHub is both diverse and interconnected. And that's why, at this year's report, we want to share with you how millions of our developers are interconnected with each other when leveraging projects and libraries on GitHub, which have become the core dependency in their work. On average, a GitHub repository can depend on 203 other packages. And our top, uh, top open 50 open source projects serve as dependencies for over 3.6 million downstream project repositories. It should also be noted that many of these packages, many of these projects are packages themselves. In fact, many of them host over hundreds of packages in their ecosystem. Rachel, from GitHub's perspective, how do you see this trend of interdependency? Yeah, I mean, it's a really exciting trend. These numbers are phenomenal and actually staggering. Um, you know, obviously companies big and small are really on board with open source. And, you know, it, it's, it's easy to understand why, right? Let's say I'm writing a, a product or a project, 
and I want to do some string manipulation. I'm going to try to write that myself. I'm probably not going to test it very well. I'm probably going to make some mistakes. It's going to be buggy. Why would I not just depend on a very robust package that's extremely well tested, that has lots and lots of real world usage out there? Right. It's just a much more logical thing to do so that I can Makes spend sense. you know, my precious time, and all of our time is precious, right? We can spend our time working on the sort of core differentiation differentiated value mm -hmm. that we want for our business. So I think you know, that's, that's really part of the ex explanation of the interconnection. But another trend that I, that I see that is very positive, and this is something I've thought about a lot in my career over time, and I'm thinking about a lot at GitHub as well, is healthier dependency management. So um, you know, for sure, we're always going to see lots of copying, pasting, vendor dependencies. That's not going to go away anytime soon. But I do really love um, the, the trend towards better dependency management. Right. And so using metadata files to describe modules, for instance, this is an evolution of the Go programming language, which I, which I think is extremely positive. Um, so, you know, these evolutions can help give more visibility to people into what they're actually depending on and a better understanding of how their dependencies are changing, mm -hmm. which is really important to establish confidence in, you know, this interconnected uh, universe. Um, and, you know, it also enables features. So, for instance, uh, when you understand your dependency tree, um, that enables features such as getting alerts when uh, you know, a package needs updating or when there's a security vulnerability right. to fix, for instance. Um, so this is something that um, you know, GitHub is working on a lot. I will do a shout out to uh, two announcements that were made in the, in the keynote this morning as well. So I think GitHub Packages is a really interesting product in this space, allowing you to do things like see a diff between releases, which is part of that being able to understand what you're depending on. Right. And then the other one I'll call out is a little different. It's the um, GitHub Sponsors Program. So I think one of the um, sort of factors that can cause reluctance to rely on open source is this idea of, you know, what if I build my business around this open source technology and then it becomes unfunded, the maintainers go away, you know, will I be in trouble? So GitHub Sponsors really provides an avenue to add some stability to the ecosystem by providing funding to key maintainers. Right. So I think that'll be an interesting thing to track over time as well. Definitely. And uh, speaking of packaging, yes. Stephen, is there any best practice you can uh, share? And, what, and I'm curious to learn the latest trend in the industry as well. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's so much a best practice. I mean, uh, well, so the two things I know early in my career kind of startled me, right? So I had the experience, you know, when I picked up, when I first picked up Linux, uh, I got started on a, a, a distribution called Gentoo Linux. So I don't know if there are any Gentoo users in, in the audience here, but basically anybody who's used a, uh, any you know, Linux distribution has had this probably same experience at some point, which is, you know, you're introduced to the concept of this package repository, right? So in other words, if I want MySQL, if I want, you know, sort of, uh, you know, the Apache web server, whatever I want, it's just a command away, right? right? And coming from other operating systems, you're like, why doesn't everyone do this? I mean, this is, you know, it's a revelation on the one hand. On the other, it really shouldn't be, right? It should just be the way that, <laughs> um, you know, things happen. So I had this experience, you know, certainly uh, uh, learning this technology way back when. And yet, you know, when, you know, sort of as an analyst, we would go out and talk to sort of all these different software engineers and charge your projects. And, you know, sort of the importance of that moment really hadn't sort of connected to the actual project. So as an example, I won't name names here. Uh, there was a, a database project we talked to. And they said, well, you know, hey, we think we have this better project, and um, you know, we, you know, we're we're really getting sort of outgained, you know, from a usage standpoint. You know, why do you think that is? And we talked to them and said, well, okay, you know, guess what? They're in the Linux repository, and you're not. And you know, they had come back and said, well, no, no, you don't understand. We have a better database. And we had to go back and say, yeah, I understand that in your opinion, but it's in <laughs> the repository. <laughs> so the point is, is basically that packaging really matters. Um, the industry, I think, as a whole, has really started to get this. You know, certainly packaging, uh, you know, is now commonplace, not just in operating systems. You know, runtimes, you know, various languages, and so on. Rachel mentioned, um, you know, Go is sort of one example. Uh, I spend most of my time these days in R. R has a very, very vital, you know, sort of package system called CRAN. Um, so you know, the, the net is is that 
you know, basically the best practice, honestly, is, is that think about the way that users are likely to encounter your software and think about how best to package it to make it convenient for them to use. Right. right? Because depending on what you're doing and depending on how it's going to get used, there's going to be some different type of packaging mechanism, some different package network. But you really have to invest the time to think beyond just the boundaries of your project. You have to think about how does your project actually get in somebody's hands, because historically, you know, um, there has been a tendency, you know, tendency in the industry to say, you know, you know, best engineering wins. And not only doesn't the best engineering win every time, it doesn't win most of the time. And most of the time, the best package and the easiest to consume software is ultimately what ends up getting used. Um, so, you know, basically, the, the the best practice is make sure you're packaging however you, you know that makes sense for you to do. That's very simple, but also very insightful. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Um, our community is both uh, interconnected and diverse. However, security is always on our mind. In the last year, we have seen you help to remediate over 7.6 million security alerts. And in addition to that, Dependabot has helped to merge over 200,000 automated fix via pull request. So Rachel and Steven, both, a question for both of you. How do you view the relation between interdependency and security? And do you think we can strike a balance here? It's a great question, Kathy, because so far we've been really talking all about the value and the positive side of uh, open source. But for sure, there's a risk inherent on depending on the fast-moving open source ecosystem. Um, so companies and individuals really need tools to be able to both trust and verify the integrity of their software development supply chain. Um, and so that's everything from commits, through releases, through public packages. And these stats, you know, they're, they're really exciting. They're a really great step in the right direction when we think about you know, where we were last year. But there's still so much more work to be done. Um, you know, that uh, security is not GitHub's responsibility alone, but we really want to enable the community and the world to get better at security. So this is everyone's responsibility from developers right. to maintainers to security experts and researchers and so on. And so we really want to build the ecosystem and the capabilities. I'm sure it's super stressful to be a maintainer and you have to worry about you know, what's going on. Um, so you know, we all play a role in uh, securing the world's open source. Uh, I think there's going to be some cool announcements in tomorrow's keynote focused on security, but I do feel like we have a really long roadmap um, to figure out. So we have all sorts of ideas about, you know, we've started using ML to help uh, identify bad actors sooner, right. and you know there's lots of technology advancements that can help. Um, you know, one call out I did want to make is um, I'm very excited that uh, GitHub has recently welcomed the folks from Semel to the GitHub family. So those are a group of people who are really good um, code intelligence, code understanding experts, and great security researchers. And um, they're certainly going to help us build the capabilities we need to help enable um, communities to get more secure code over time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I think from our perspective, it really depends on who we're talking to, right? You know, so in other words, if I'm talking to an individual developer, you know, look, I, I've, been in, I've been in your shoes. Like, you know, security work is often not very fun. It can be very tedious. It's not uh, something that, you know, you necessarily want to, you know, spend time on. You'd rather be adding new features and, and sort of uh, doing things that are more intellectually interesting in, in many cases. But the flip side is, is that, um, you know, the... the you know, sort of prospect of being paged in the middle of the night because, you know, hey, you have this vulnerability that's been introduced um, and is causing, you know, sort of, ex, you know, sort of issues, you know, you really have to, to sort of be willing to invest and to take the time, and more importantly these days, to take advantage of the tools and services that are out there, right? right. So whether they come from GitHub or, any, or anyone else, um, you know, you, you know, really need to be able to, uh, you know, take that, you know, take advantage of the resources that are available to make yourself um, to make it possible, I guess, to deliver more secure applications. Um, nothing is going to be completely secure, of course, but there are some simple things that you can do typically, um, again, depending on sort of what you're doing, uh, you know, to produce higher quality, you know, sort of lower vulnerability uh, output. But then organizationally speaking, you know, sort of the, the flip side of it is that when we talk to managers and so on, um, frequently it's to give their teams time, mm -hmm. right? Because there's such, a pri you know, there's such a priority placed these days on velocity, understandably so, that one of the things that sort of, you know, something has to give somewhere. And in many cases, what ends up, you know, sort of falling by the wayside is that sort of attention and focus on security. Right. So, you know, like I said, you know, for, for individual developers, yes, you have to care, but, you know, the managers themselves have to give the, the teams, um, you know, enough time, you know, to go through and to do the, the types of analysis that's going to, um, again, you know, sort of result in, in lower defect um, uh, code. 
definitely. Security is always our priority at GitHub. In 2019, there are over 370 languages exist on GitHub. While the popularity and the usage trend change over time, something special has happened this year. For the very first time in our history, Python has outranked Java, became the second most popular programming language on GitHub by the count of repository contributors. So Rachel, what do you think is behind the growth of Python? Well, this is super cool. Um, uh, Python, you know, it's just uh, easy to learn, it's a flexible, and it's a, just an extremely useful language. I mean, uh, I think Python was probably the last language that I used. Um, you know, I spent a good chunk of my career focused on uh, research in engineering productivity. And as part of that, the teams I, I worked with did research into uh, language adoption and language productivity. And you know, we would often find that um, while Python wasn't you know, the most people's primary uh, software development language, it was a lot of people's second language, meaning that tons of people are using Python some of the time, which makes a lot of sense given how you know, practical it is and how easy to use it is. Right. That being said, there's something else behind uh, this uptick in Python, right? which is really this explosion of work in the data science and machine learning space. So yourself as a data scientist, I'm of sure course. you rely heavily on Python, which yes. is uh, you know, part of that story. Um, TensorFlow is also one of the most uh, popular open source projects on uh, GitHub. Right. And you know, for TensorFlow, we see thousands of direct contributors. And when you look at the dependency graph, we see tens of thousands of indirect contributors. So you know, that is you know, part of the story of uh, the growth of Python. There are also lots of other um, packages, frameworks, and tools that, are, uh, that exist in the data science space mm -hmm. um, about natural language processing and machine learning and so on that right. are all uh, leveraging Python. So I think that's part of the story. Definitely. As a Python user myself, like you said, I was very excited. I've made my fair share contribution to this <laughs> result. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, we also want to share with you some other language with impressive growth in the last year. For instance, Dart, which has grown over 530%, and other languages with, uh, with impressive growth, including Rust, HCL, Kotlin, TypeScript, and more. So Steven, one last question for you. What do you think is behind the growth of these language? And do you think these are just fads? Uh, so the short answer is no, they're not fads. Uh, you know, as, as I sort of talked about at the top, you know, Redmonk is, is a company that has long sort of preached you know, sort of the empowerment of developers. And frankly, there's no better evidence for that than a chart like this. Right? So in other words, if you go back 20 years, you know, within most enterprises, there were one or two sanctioned languages. Um, you know, that were permitted to be used in sort of business applications and so on. And now, I mean, you can have a single application that might have three or four or five different languages in one application, right? And why is that? It's because developers have now become empowered to say, you know what, this language is not the best tool for this job. I can use this other, you know, sort of uh, this other runtime and it's more appropriate. So, you know, sort of that being said, you know, basically we see three characteristics to languages that tend to grow in our rankings. Um, the GitHub, uh, uh, GitHub's language rankings actually are half of ours. Uh, and the three sort of characteristics that um, you know, sort of are most common in the, the successful uh, languages that rise up the charts are versatility. So Rachel referred to this with, with Python, um, discussed the fact that you, know, you can use it for glue code over here, you can use it for AIML, you can use it for data science, you know, it has lots of different sort of potential use cases. And you, know, you see this in languages like Java, which has stuck around for a long time, Java you know, grew up as, well, originally it was designed for cable set-top boxes. Most people forget that. Uh, it grew, sort of morphed from there into, hey, this is how you build business applications, but has since sort of you know, grown out into, you know, there's whole classes of, of uh, databases that have been written in Java. Um, you know, it has a mobile story you know, sort of via Android and so on. So it's versatile enough to find you know, sort of different homes. You know, so that tends to be you know, sort of one factor in success. Um, recently, more recently, a focus on security. So uh, specifically on that list, Rust and TypeScript, you know, which have come up. And we, uh, TypeScript is one of the fastest growers we've seen uh, ever, in fact. And what we, you know, we hear when we talk to developers is that you know, they want to use tools that are going to sort of make their applications more secure by design without having to invest a ton of you know, sort of effort into them. Um, but then, you know, particularly in TypeScript's case, the third characteristic that we see in terms of successful languages are those that are able to piggyback on top of large existing communities, right? right? So TypeScript, you know, obviously can piggyback off of, um, uh, off of JavaScript. Uh, Kotlin, you know, which is on the list here, can piggyback off of Java. So when you have, you know, when you're not starting from scratch, when you can intermingle with a large existing code base 
uh, or large existing code bases, but also large existing populations of users. Uh, it just makes it that much easier to, to sort of get going. So, you know, those are a couple of factors that we have seen sort of historically, and we've been tracking languages now for, I don't know, probably 10 years, 10, 11 years. Um, those are the things that tend to be most successful over time. That's very interesting. Thank you for sharing the insights with us. When putting together the Octoverse report, we were so amazed by all the work and the contribution you have achieved last year. We want to say thank you for continuing to build the Octoverse with us, and thank you for giving us a chance to share the data with you. Any closing thoughts? Kathy, thank you so much yeah, for hosting you, this session. Thank you for doing such a great job in pulling the data for the report along with your team. It's been such a pleasure to be here today. And Stephen, thank you for bringing your My industry pleasure. expertise to the table. This has been a, a great talk, and I really look forward to seeing how the world continues to evolve over the next year. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. Thank you.